Law Center at the University of the Western Cape Faculty of Law and the Environmental Law Association of South Africa. My name is Dr. Angela van der Bach. I am an acting director of the Global Environmental Law Center. I'm also a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Law at the University of Western Cape. We're also joined today by my colleague, uh, Mr. Tendai Bonga. Uh, I say colleague because both of us are involved at the Environmental Law Association, but uh, Mr. Bonga is also an environmental lawyer uh, with the law firm in South Africa, Weber Wenzel, and he is based in Cape Town. He also represents the Western Cape province uh, on the EXCO or the board of the Environmental Law Association. So today's webinar is quite exciting. It builds on our theme of webinars we've been hosting at the Global Environmental Law Center surrounding climate litigation. One of the, the first webinars we had was discussing our agenda. And today we get, we get to continue on that discussion, but we can compare it uh, with the current or about to start a First Nations case in Australia. Pabai, Pabai, um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and we're going to have a look at what these two cases mean for government commitments in terms of climate change, but also touch on what is the role of First Nations communities, for example, in climate litigation. Uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances, Lucy Maxwell from the Urgent Office Foundation couldn't join us today but we are still in good hands because her colleague is joining us. So I'm going to give over to Tain Dai. Tain Dai is going to introduce our two speakers for today and then we will proceed. Thank you very much, Angela, and uh, welcome to you, everyone. I'll go ahead and introduce Dennis. Um, Dennis is a climate change lawyer and he's based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He is the legal counsel at the Agenda Foundation and is also the director of climate of the Climate Litigation Network. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, uh, Dennis, and we appreciate you standing in and taking um, Lucy's place. We are also joined this morning by Cassandra. Uh, Cassandra is an associate at The Finney MacDonald, which is a boutique Australian class actions law firm. Cassandra acts for large numbers of plaintiffs who are otherwise unable to access justice individually in complex strategic lawsuits against corporations and governments. Um, Cassandra is passionate in her work to promote accountability and justice and has a particular interest in First Nations rights and issues. I think with that said, uh, I'm going to hand over to Dennis, uh, who's going to Chat to us briefly about the agenda case. Um, over to you, Dennis. Thank you, Tendai. Um, yeah, and I will, I'll make some some comments about the case and also specifically some uh, specific ex aspects of it, uh, which may help also people to to understand how this case, which is just one case in the Netherlands, um, you know, can have and is having uh, also important for other cases in very different um, jurisdictions. Um, so I'll start with a very quick and brief uh, timeline. We started this case by filing a letter to the to the state in 2012, saying that we didn't think that the state was doing enough to combat climate change, and we filed the actual case in 2013. So that was still well two years before um, before the Paris Agreement, for instance, uh, came into force. The first judgment of the court was also prior. Uh, to the Paris Agreement. That was in June of 2015, so half a year before the Paris Agreement. Um, we won for the first time in the district court. Uh, the state appealed, they appealed twice, and then we won again twice in 2018 before the Court of Appeal, and then finally at the end of 2019 before the Dutch Supreme Court. So that's a very short timeline. So what, 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 what was the context in which we filed this case in 2013? Well, the, the Netherlands is part of the EU and the EU has climate policies and climate targets, but the Netherlands itself didn't have any specific climate law or acts. It didn't have a, a target. It used to have a target previously until 2010, but it didn't have any target of its own. It didn't have any specific climate laws or acts or standards that we could enforce in the case. So we were left with, well, 
how do we actually create an obligation on the state in the absence of such a specific uh, domestic law? Um, and there were two, there, th th what we did is that we filed a tort case, basically saying that the, the state was acting unlawfully on two bases. One was that they were violating the unwritten, an, an unwritten duty of care of the state towards its citizens. So basically uh, the, gen the doctrine of uh, hazardous negligence, we said the state is responsible for the climate. It is contributing to this very dangerous situation and it should do its part to prevent this very dangerous situation. So not that different from you going to your neighbor who has a tree that is almost falling on your house and claiming before a court that uh, this person needs to take care of the situation with regards to this tree because it's creating a dangerous situation. In very brief terms, that, that kind of concept we applied to the much larger issue of climate change. And what we also said is this is also a violation of human rights, more specifically the right to life and the right to private life as uh, protected under the European Convention on Human Rights. The first court, uh, the, uh, the court of first instance, uh, uh, judged on uh, on the basis of this open duty of care, this uh, what we call proper social conduct that any person, company, but also the state should should show, uh, and not on the human rights basis. And then the the, the court of appeal start uh, 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 decided the, uh, the the case on the basis of the human rights uh, grounds, and then the supreme court as well. So basically, this case has two different grounds, so to say, two different legal grounds, but. Um, uh, but the commonalities between the two, but between these two grounds, were are, are you know the, almost identical because you have two basically open norms. Because also the human rights itself, the right to life, doesn't tell you okay there's a right to life, but what does that really tell you about what the state needs to do in relation to climate change? They're basically open norms, and that's what we did in the case in uh, uh, bringing it to the court. We said well this open norm needs to be filled with. Uh, international law, with science, with also uh, agreements that uh, countries have made under the negotiations under the UNFCCC. So every year they come together at the conference of the parties, the COPs, they have decisions, they write down certain things that they agree on. That's not necessarily binding as such. And these international laws are not binding as such, but they do guide what this norm, what the norm under domestic law needs to be with regards to how the, the, the government behaves vis-a-vis -vis its the, the residents in its country. So now I'll, I'll go to what the, the Supreme Court, the final Supreme Court judgment said about this, about this duty, which was then mainly based on uh, on, on human rights. And in short, the, 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 the Supreme Court says, well, the threat of uh, uh, climate change is undeniable. Uh, the, the impact on human rights is undeniable. And if this were to be just a, uh, a problem that was solely caused by the Dutch state, that undeniably it would be responsible for this. So it asks the question, does the mere fact that this is a problem that is caused by multiple entities, by more states, by the, the globe as a whole, does that take away that responsibility? Well, and then it looked at, okay, what are the sources on the basis of which, what are similar legal uh, spheres where we can look at to make this duty of human rights in climate change, which is just a new factual circumstance we have to deal with, what, what other sources of interpretation we can look at? And they looked at international climate law, international environmental law, but also international private law. So with regards to international climate law, it looked at the Paris Agreement, uh, and uh, which sets out responsibilities of states for their own emissions on their own territory. It looked at international environmental law with regards to the no harm principle, which also to, uh, which also states that you are responsible for the damage that you have caused yourself. And it looked at international private law, uh, uh, the principle of partial responsibility, which again says, if you cause part of the problem, you are responsible for that part of the problem. And on the basis of this, the, the, the Supreme Court came to the conclusion, on the basis of this, we interpret the scope of these human rights obligations to mean that the state has to do its fair share of the total burden of preventing dangerous climate change. 
because we started the case in 2013. At the time, the danger limit was still set at two degrees, later in the Paris Agreement, and again now last year in the, in the global in the in the pardon in the uh, Glasgow Climate Pact, it's now one and a half degrees. We know we need to keep it to lower, but at the time we were still when we started the case, the danger line was two. So that was throughout the entire proceedings. That was the basis with which we had to uh, work with. They said, okay, you need to do your fair share, and because of your obligation of due diligence also an obligation that is derived from international law, you also will have to substantiate that what you're doing is enough. So you can't just say, well, here is a target, I'm going to do this and that's sufficient. And why is that so important? Because that's actually the general practice of governments around the world. They just pick a target, say that it is enough, but it's never in, you know, almost never in relation to what is the global available emission space. There is an, almost never a, 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 a reference of a national target in relation to how much and how does that add up if we look at all the other states. What if an, all the other states do what we do with regards to our relative uh, level of ambition? And that's actually what the court said. Well, you need to substantiate that this is enough. So that's the duty. And then came the next step, how do you make that concrete? What exactly, the, how much should the state then be reducing its emissions? And there's this whole, which, you know, which is the, the thing mostly discussed in the context of uh, climate, uh, climate litigation. You, know, you, you get to the political question, shouldn't it be politics that actually decide how much we should be reducing? And principally, the, the Supreme Court said, yes, principally it is for politics to decide how much they should be reducing. But we're left in a situation where politics is not taking up that task. They're simply not doing it. And given the fact that there is this general obligation to reduce your emissions as to prevent dangerous climate change and reducing emissions is the only thing you can do to limit the damage, right? there's no other option. It's not that you have 10 different things you can do to prevent climate change. No, it's limiting emissions. That's the only thing. So that's simple. Given that this is an obligation, it cannot be the case that you can do nothing. In other words, there is a lower limit to what you are allowed to do with regards to your emissions reductions. And is the task of a court, actually it's the obligation of a court to look at the available material, to look at the available sources, to look at the science, to see what that lower limit is. Well, and in, in the case of Virgenda, the court found that lower limit to be a reduction of 25% by 2020 compared to 1990 levels. And that came from a range that the IPCC had uh, uh, advised in, 2000, in its 2007 report. In that report, the IPCC had said, if we want to limit a global um, uh, temperature increase to two degrees, the, the Annex one countries, the old industrial countries would need to reduce their emissions by a minimum of 25 to 40% by 2020. So the court took the lower end of that range and said, well, this is really the lower end. Not only is this the lower end of this range, by now we actually know it's not enough because we actually need to reduce to one and a half degrees. So it, it, it up, uphold the, the finding of, of, um, of the court of first instance by looking at what is really your minimum level and also saying, well, this is what we find on the basis of science, but the state has not put anything against this. The state has not in any way argued that this is actually not what should be happening and presented us with any other credible calculation of what, that, what they are doing is enough. So, you know, we as a court have, uh, can do nothing else but to order the state to do this because that's the only way that the right can be uh, protected. Um, and that's the, you know, that's the that, that's the summary uh, of of that judgment in in 2019. It has had a lot of impact in the Netherlands um, uh, with regards to how climate change is being perceived, the, the role of the state vis-a-vis -vis climate change, and we luckily now have much more progressive governments, not necessarily progressive on the whole. Uh, on, on every policy area, but in climate change, they're really taking uh, the issue, luckily, much more seriously than, uh, than they have done thus far. And now uh, for, for, for this, I'll, I'll leave it to that and, and hand over to you, Cass, and I'm very happy to answer any other questions that, that, that there are. Uh,
maybe uh, with regards to uh, to our experience in the Netherlands and more broadly globally in in, in how this has influenced other countries. Thank you very much for that, Dennis. Um, Cassandra, we'll hand over to you. Thank you, Tendo, and, and thank you, Dennis, um, for that introduction. Um, I might actually just begin um, by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional owners of the land um, from which I'm speaking today, um, known as Melbourne in Australia. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, and I do extend that respect to any First Nations people attending this seminar here too. So uh, the case that I'll be speaking about today is a First Nations led uh, proceeding um, and there's a, a, a significant aspect of um, First Nations rights and um, First Nations visibility that comes across in this case. Um, I'll, I'll begin by providing, I suppose, a bit of an outline of the climate st status of Australia <clears throat> on the international scale. Um, Australia's response to climate change is, is one of the weakest in the world. We're responsible for uh, about 1.3% of global emissions um, while taking up only 0.3% of the global population. So as one of the largest global emitters, um, the government is igno ignoring urgent calls to action from the scientific community to reduce Australia's contribution in line with the Paris Agreement and in line with the available science. Um, even earlier this year, the Secretary General of the United Nations called out Australia specifically as a holdout among other G20 developed economies who have announced meaningful emissions reductions by 2030. So the case um, that I uh, am working on and the case um, that I represent, the plaintiffs that I represent is Pabai Pabai and, and Guy Paul Kabai against the Commonwealth of Australia. It's one of a growing number of climate litigation cases in Australia, as people increasingly turn to the courts in the face of government inaction um, on the climate crisis. <clears throat> the case is unique um, within the Australian context in that it's the first time uh, anyone in Australia has actually argued that the whole of the federal government, the Commonwealth itself, uh, not just a minister um, or a d department or agency um, or a coal mine even or um, private corporation has a duty to protect uh, people from climate harm. And so, and it's also, like I mentioned, the first class action that's actually been led by First Nations people. Um, so it, within that context, I might outline um, the Torres Strait and, and for those of you who aren't familiar with that part of, um, part of Australia, it might give you some context. Um, it's made up of over 200 small islands uh, and their surrounding waters. And it's between the top uh, northeastern point of Australia and Papua New Guinea. <coughs> um, many of the islands are yet quite low lying and they're surrounded by coral reefs. Um, and the communities there rely heavily on fishing as part of their cultural practice and, and food resources. Uh, the Torres Strait is known as Zenodeth Kes to the indigenous traditional owners who have lived there for over 65,000 years. Their knowledge and their unique cultural connection to their lands and waters is known as island custom or island custom. Uh, and it's survived by being passed down from generation to generation um, throughout this time and, and following um, colonization of Australia as well. Uh, but now they're facing an existential threat and that is fueled by uh, climate change and um, manifesting in rising sea levels uh, on these islands. Already um, the communities on these islands are experiencing the effects of global warming now. Um, this includes flooding from increased storms and king tides, coastal erosion, coral bleaching, heat waves, they impact the very way of life um, of these communities and uh, they damage people, the floods damage people's homes, salt water is getting into gardens uh, and, and ruining the ability to grow vegetables, uh, to feed families, 
extreme heat is impacting an already quite vulnerable um, population in the terms of health. Uh, and changes in ocean patterns are also affecting marine life and fishing practices as well. So uh, it, it's coming in from all angles, um, the, the impacts already. So if the Australian government doesn't change course pretty fast, then um, islands in the Torres Strait could actually become uninhabitable in the future, forcing um, Torres Strait Islanders to leave their homes and severing thousands of years of connection to their land and, and water. Um, the outcome could be that Torres Strait Islanders could be Australia's first climate change refugees. And one of the interesting aspects of this case is <clears throat> In, in, in the context of the uh, international scale, is that we have a developed country like Australia facing uh, pretty extreme threats um, at, a, at an imminent level and an existing level, um, which is perhaps not something that's as common across other global climate litigation, um, seeking to obviously benefit the global community from the threats of climate change, um, but ordinarily it's it's less developed um, the countries that are suffering the worst and that often contribute the least. Um, so there's that kind of difference uh, here in Australia, which um, I think is unique to this particular case. Um, with that, I might introduce you to the two applicants um, of the case. And I've got a short video that I, will um, play, which gives you a bit of insight um, into who they are and, and what it's like where they live and what, what they're experiencing. Cassandra, we can't hear anything. Does the video have sound? I'm sorry. Yes, it, it does. Um, and I selected the sound uh, box when I shared it, but it might be best if you could try, um, Angela. All right, I will do so. Sorry about that. No problem. Apologies for the delay. No, I forgot to show or to add the sound. This journey is a very important journey. We don't want to lose our community under the water. But the erosion that's mainly affecting our livelihood and our cultural sites, our reefs, it's all happening because of the climate change. The journey will go forever until we come to the stage where we are doing something about this erosion. We're losing our people. We're lo losing our great, great grandfathers. If we know that we are born to the land, that's our identity, who you are. Tight. I've got water coming in from through the river, fill the swamps up. 
and water coming in through the drainage system, and you know, we are living on a uh, very narrow strip of land. If, if it doesn't going to work, well, we'll be underwater. <laughs> uh, environment refugees on our own islands. This is very important to me that this will need to be solved to save my families, my people, my community. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, Angela. Um, so that video hopefully gives you a little bit of an idea of um, the landscape and the connection to country that um, Torres Strait Islanders have. And Paul and Padai uh, are the representatives of all Torres Strait Islanders in this case. It's a class action and um, it, it represents everyone from the Torres Strait, uh, whether they're living there or not. Um, a large portion of Torres Strait Islanders are living on mainland Australia as well, um, but have the ability to, to suffer the same harms uh, or similar harms from uh, of those living on the land. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit later. It's um, all part of the connection um, that they have that's a cultural practice uh, and unique to Torres Strait Islanders. So, we filed the case last year in October. It's now being set down for trial for June next year. So um, a while away, there's, there's a fair bit to do between now and then. Um, we're preparing for various interlocutory steps, such as um, the discovery process, um, evidence of experts and lay witnesses, and the opt-out process, which, um, is a process in Australia where um, class actions by their nature include all uh, members of um, the alleged group uh, when a case is filed. And um, if you're not interested in being part of the case or wanna run a case by yourself um, or for any other reason, you actually have to choose to opt out. So um, it's a, a regime where everyone's included by um, by the nature of the proceeding at the beginning um, and the court has to arrange a process where we allow the option um, for certain people to opt out of the case if they wish to. Um, because the case is ongoing and uh, we've got um, professional privilege and things like that to consider, I can, I'll, I'll speak about it at a relatively high level. Um, Paul and Pabai, they allege that the government owes them, and like I said, all Torres Strait Islanders, a duty of care to protect them from the harms caused by climate change. So unlike other established duties in the common law that, um, that Dennis was speaking about um, earlier as well, um, you might have a duty of care owed between a, a doctor and a patient, all sorts of categories exist um, where it's a given that a duty of care is owed. Um, this is a claim for a novel duty of care. Um, and so we say that that's brought about by the special relationship that exists between Torres Strait Islanders and the Commonwealth of Australia. Um, there's a number of factors about that relationship which gives rise, um, we say, to the duty of care. Uh, and that includes a, an international treaty that exists between Australia and Papua New Guinea. So um, those two bodies of land between us, uh, I guess, surrounding the Torres Strait. Uh, and, and that treaty is about the protection of the environment in the Torres Strait, as well as a variety of Australian legislation that um, really goes to the heart of protecting um, Indigenous people, uh, land rights under Native Title Acts um, and cultural heritage and um, things of that nature all go to the reason why as opposed to just anyone, the government um, really owes a, a special and different relationship, uh, a duty of care, sorry, to Torres Strait Islanders. Um, the case alleges that the duty that has that is owed has been breached already and is continuing um, to be breached um, by failing to have regard to the best science that is available when setting emissions reduction targets. So um, like I said earlier, uh, 
uh, Australia's performance on the international scale and um, their consistency with uh, science, uh, the, the scientific consensus about uh, keeping global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees, as close to 1.5 degrees as possible, um, is abysmal. And uh, it, it, it alleges that this, uh, the, the science that is available, that includes the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the World Meteorological um, Organization, all sorts of domestic scientific bodies as well, uh, all come to this conclusion, uh, an objective conclusion, um, that uh, certain uh, action is needed um, across the whole scale of uh, the whole scale of the world, uh, and it's uh, our allegation that the government isn't complying with or having regard to that science. Which is, um, which is ultimately the breach of the duty of care um, because of the impacts that will um, be reached on Torres Strait Islanders in particular. The current target uh, for Australia um, for context is, um, uh, sorry, under the Paris Agreement is 26 to 28% below 2005 emissions levels. Uh, we say that's inconsistent with the best available science, which um, by many accounts, indicates that what really is required is um, a reduction of more like 74%. So wildly outside um, what's, what's needed. And um, in, importantly as well, the trajectory um, is, is slow. Uh, there's still um, coal mines being opened in this country uh, and um, the reluctance to really transition out of um, the fossil fuel industry um, is, is strongly felt here. Um, so the urgency of action is, is um, certainly not being taken seriously by the government either. So the consequences of, of ignoring this science for Torres Strait Islanders, it's, it's pretty dire. The global average surface, um, global average surface temperature, uh, if it reaches beyond 1.5 degrees, the frequency, the intensity uh, and the size of the impacts that are currently already being felt are projected to increase. Um, there's additional risks to human health, um, like infectious diseases and undernutrition that can arise um, as well. And ultimately Torres Strait Islanders may lose their homelands and their, their custom uh, that I was speaking about earlier, island custom, which is really a place-based cultural practice. So in terms of what they're asking the court, um, Paul and Pabai are seeking a declaration from the Federal Court of Australia, which is um, the court in which it's being, the case is being issued, um, that a duty of care exists. So uh, firstly, just a recognition, um, because like I said, it's a novel case that that duty exists uh, and also an injunction to prevent the Commonwealth um, from continuing to breach it. And so uh, the, the outcome of that would be that the government is required um, to have regard to the best available science. Um, it, the case also seeks damages for the harm suffered and costs um, for the case as well. So uh, it's a while away yet, um, but the case could be really significant for climate duty of care jurisprudence in Australia, and it could potentially influence analogous climate litigation around the country, uh, or even internationally. If established, it would be um, a unique duty of care. Um, that's part of our argument is that the Australian government and the um, people of the Torres Strait Islands have a very unique and specific relationship. So it would be interesting to see if it could be applied to other governments in their relationships with First Nations people. Um, but I suspect it would be quite heavily fact dependent on each case. Um, but we consider this, this proceeding to be a really particularly important strategic case um, because of the, the notable emissions profile of Australia on the global scale. And it also draws attention to the vulnerability um, of people to climate change within the territory of a developed country, like I mentioned earlier. Um, that's more or less an overview of the case of Pabe. Um, Angela, if it's helpful, I might um, 
pass back to you um, for maybe some facilitation of discussion and we're more than happy to answer uh, any other questions that, that arise as well. Thank you, Cassandra. Thank you also to you, Dennis, for your insightful uh, overview and background of the agenda case. Uh, I have so many questions already, but I won't hog this time and I will give the audience an opportunity. I think what is good to keep in mind if we compare these cases, uh, besides the obvious that it's two different countries and two different timelines, um, and the, uh, you know, the Urjenda case building on that two degree and Pavai now working on the one and a half um, degree for, uh, in terms of the Paris Agreement. Um, what's interesting is that, or, or to me, is the, the remedy sort. I think that that is a little bit different between these two cases. And if you could just elaborate on that, and then before we do hand off to the audience, just my question, um, I'm quite interested, uh, Cassandra, whether you think anyone will bring up separation of powers and how strongly is that doctrine protected or adhered to or acknowledged in the Australian context, um, because that did also come out in the Urgenda case. And then, Thinking about costs and damages, um, how would that be calculated? Is that for the current generation? Is that for future generations? And yeah, just your thoughts on how, how the court might, I assume they'd have to look to experts to help them calculate that. Um, preliminary, that's preliminary con comments from me. I'll let you address that. And the attendees, you can raise your hands. You can also put um, comments in the question box and I'll keep an eye on that. Thanks. Thanks, Angela. Um, so maybe I'll, um, yeah, uh, consider some of those differences in the remedies um, between the two cases. Um, certainly, and I guess maybe my answer can sort of touch on a, a few of the questions you raised in one. Um, certainly we expect that the separation of powers um, question will be raised. Uh, we do have the defence from the government already, um, and it's certainly consistent um, with the, the line of defence that is often drawn in these cases, which is it's not a matter for the courts uh, and uh, like similarly in, in um, the case uh, with agenda um, you know the there's a there's a good argument for saying <laughs> but but what if there's no other option um, it's a different argument I would say in um, the case of Pabe, uh, I, I don't know how the that sort of lower threshold or lower limit um, argument uh, would sit within the Australian um, common law context. Um, the distinction that's often made in Australia is that, um, and, and probably throughout other common law countries, is that um, matters of policy are for government, for executive, for, for policy makers, and um, those uh, matters that are at more of an operational level can be um, adjudicated. And so, it's a fine line, um, but certainly uh, our argument is that, in fact, the um, ha having regard to best available sites before any policy decisions are made, before um, anyone gets into uh, targets and um, preferences, uh, certainly it's a complex um, world when trying to determine targets um, as there are various, I guess, various issues at play. Um, just considering the best available science, um, just having it uh, considered and and um, had regard to at the outset, say falls onto onto that operational line, and so um, can actually be addressed by the courts. Um, that's sort of where that difference um, lies, I think, between our two cases. Dennis, did you have um, any other comments on on that comparison? Yeah, I, I think that there are similarities and differences between the cases in that, yes, we sought for an order to reduce emissions. Um, but part of that also was, as I said, kind of like, and, and it relates, I mean, this, this question of remedies very much relates to the question of separation of powers, where, where at least the, the Supreme Court said, and, and I think that that should be applicable for all 
uh, uh, all countries, uh, regardless of what precisely the interpretation of separation of powers is, if you have an obligation, then it means that you can't do nothing. Right. So somewhere there has to be a lower limit. And then, of course, the question might be, OK, is the court the right one to determine that? But even if the court is not the right one to determine that, then the court can determine whether that assessment has been made at all and whether there's any reasonable, you know, whether it, 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 it passes any reasonableness standards. And if you now look globally, especially for the global north and definitely also for Australia, it, it really doesn't, right? It's so so obvious that what they're doing is in no relation sufficient uh, uh, in relation to, to other countries' efforts and in relation to the global carbon budget. So I, I think what this case in Australia does is, is very smart, is that it said, well, the basic thing that if you say that, you know, you're doing you have in climate policies it has to be based on the science it has to be in relation to the global carb to the global carbon budget and i don't also believe that the the australian state itself actually denies that there is a global carbon budget and that there's science to say what approximately the size of that global carbon budget is and if you and which is obviously you know it, it can't do anything else because that's what the ipcc is telling us which is of like the gold standard uh, of 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 what uh, of what we know about of, about climate litigation, so I, I do think that this is you know the, the way that the Australian case has solved this is a very you know very good and intelligent way of dealing with this separation of powers issue in the context of a country where that is you know where where that interpretation is much more conservative even than in many other countries so in the context of even if you have a very conservative perception of that separation of powers can never lead to uh, to to the argument that the state doesn't have to have regard of anything i mean that can't be the case yeah yeah absolutely that's right um the other point, um, Angela, that you touched on was, uh, you know, the type of remedy sought. Because every focus in, um, from our perspective on, um, I guess, uh, firstly, getting the declaration um, of the, the existence of the duty, and um, really that paves the way for, um, for the other remedies sought in this proceeding. Um, the uh, in, injunction um, to hold the government accountable um, you know, to, to prevent them from breaching their duty of care uh, is, you know, something that the courts are more likely to grapple with <clears throat> um, when we start talking about that operational policy distinction. Um, and, and that's where those arguments, I think, will really come into play, but the ones that we've just been discussing now. Um, damages is another question altogether. Um, you know, if, if, if the duty of care is, um, you know, not being breached uh, as a result of an injunction or any other type of decision taken by the government. Um, we all know that the effects of uh, emissions uh, and climate change are, are ongoing and there's this gap and there's this delay um, in, in the impacts. So it's an incredibly uh, complex question and uh, quite often in Australian courts, you'll have the question of liability determined first and then any assessment of damages um, to follow. Uh, we're not sort of far enough into this case to, to know where that would, um, where that will play out, but certainly not an easy question um, uh, from anyone's perspective. Thank you, Cassandra, and thank you, Dennis. I appreciate it. Uh, we have a question from the mm -hmm. audience from uh, John claude Ashikem. Dr. Ashikem, would you like to ask your question? I think you might be on mute, uh, Jean-Claude. Jean-Claude, can you hear us? We can't seem to hear you. You can type your question in the, in the chat box so I can read it, Jean-Claude. All right, I'm going to give John Claude an opportunity to type his question. Uh, Ting Dai, was there anything from you? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And this question is uh, for either you, Cassandra, or Dennis. Um, I've come across some commentary which suggests that you know, litigation is not the best alternative to deal with the climate crisis and that we should place more emphasis instead on activism, policy, and of course, science. I mean, how would you respond to, to that commentary based on your experience in both cases? Dennis, would you like to um, yeah, yeah, yeah. answer that I, one first? I mean, I can start that off. I mean, that's that that commentary starts from the presumption that it can be one or the other, which is entirely false. Um, I mean, we are, if you say, is litigation enough? No, definitely not. I mean, we need, do we need activism? Definitely. Do we need more policy? Yes, that's what the litigation is about. The litigation is about the fact that we need more policy and that in the absence of that policy, we are forced to go to the courts to push, to put pressure on the government to actually come up with policies that are in fact based on science. So yes, litigation is a very imperfect tool to deal with this crisis, but it is one of the most powerful tools we have right now to in the middle of this crisis actually get movement into the system. Courts, courts by themselves will never be able to solve this entire issue and get us to the temperature level where we need. But courts can hold governments to account to actually start to take this problem seriously. And that's why many activists beyond going to the streets are also going to the courts. Uh, and it's not a, a one or the other. Obviously, as a, you know, a, a, as a community, you can only, or as a person, you can only do so many things. But I think if you are a lawyer, and, and if you, then I think looking at what the what the legal tools are are very, you know, are very efficient thing of now, you know, putting your your effort and energy towards helping to solve this climate crisis. And yes, you know, we need to support the activists with what they need and support. You know, for instance, in this Australian case, support the people that are extremely vulnerable by having their voices heard in court. But no, it's not the only thing. We need many, many, many more things. I might also um, add to that that there's, I, I think um, there's a lot to be said uh, for the attention um, and uh, publicity that certain legal cases can garner, um, which uh, from a strategic perspective, whether you're in um, policy or whether you're in advocacy, um, all I guess you know builds on the same uh, the same trajectory that that, that people are trying to um, change certain minds, um, change uh, opinions in society, and get people talking. And, and that's a much more um, you know removed view uh, in terms of thinking about what how cases like this can influence people who aren't even parties to um, litigation, who aren't familiar with the legal system. Um, there's also a lot to be said for cases that are perhaps entirely unsuccessful, um, but have judgments, um, you know, otherwise condoning, um, sorry, condemning the behaviour of uh, governments or, or other actors in the space. And um, that does go a long way. Ultimately, international shame is really playing a huge part um, in the in the way that um, a lot of countries are viewing themselves and, and that national identity, um, you know, as as someone who's not keeping up, um, I think actually holds a lot of uh, a lot of credence. So it's it's an interesting um, way to look at it. But I agree certainly with you, Dennis, that it's it's one part of the puzzle. And um, if one if one way of uh, doing it was enough, then then we wouldn't be here. Uh, while we wait for John Claude's question and everyone else, or if there are any other questions from the audience, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. I'm not, oh, there's JC, John Claude. John Claude, you can ask your question. Thank you. JC, you are on mute. Hello? Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful 
presentations, Cassandra and Dennis. That was so insightful. Um, I have a question for you both. Um, Dennis, you agree with you very much that uh, when you said that there is a complex city about a human rights violation of sticks in uh, international law. And this is quite eminent in the in the climate change rage regime. Uh, so my question to you is: uh, in terms of the case you you, you uh, mentioned in the Netherlands, I would like to, to know how did the court arrive at the connection between uh, um, um, the the obligation on on the climate change and the environmental right protection in view of, of them meaning what emission can be lowered in, in order to protect uh, people from uh, climate change harm, which is an environmental issue. And uh, to Cassandra. Uh, uh, just hold on, sorry. John Claude, your sound is very uh, scratchy. Could you maybe adjust your microphone? We can't hear properly. I'm also having a problem there. Can you hear me now? Is it clear? It's less clear. Could you, Dennis, did you make out that question? Well, Jean Claude, what, what I understood, and it was also a bit scratchy for me, but what I understood you asking was how do you make uh, the connection from this, from the from the international law? to how much should every country be reducing because international law itself doesn't actually tell you how much each country should be reducing. Is that right? Was that the scope of your question? Jean-Claude, can you still hear us? John Claude, can you hear us? I think there might be a, an audio issue with John I Claude. I think so. Uh, Dennis, I did also get that from his question. Mm. So if you want, you, you can speak to that and hopefully he can uh, post in the chat. Otherwise, we do have another question in the chat we can move to after this. Thank you. So <clears throat> more in general terms, the, the way that international law is generally being used in these cases is not as a directly binding uh, a source. And that's also because the international law doesn't really provide these binding rules. I mean, uh, if you look at the Paris Agreement, it is largely a, there are largely procedural obligations. There is a procedural obligation to, uh, uh, to to, to hand in what your national target is. But there's not the, 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 the objective obligation in the treaty as such to uh, reduce by a certain amount, or even that it has to add up to one to, 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 to a certain amount. So the, the main, if you look at the Paris Agreement, the main value of the Paris Agreement to this litigation is in Article 2, which says the goal of this treaty and of all of these effort is to hold a uh, temperature to well below two degrees and to aim for 1.5 degrees. And that norm was then also kind of like strengthened by the, the, the Glasgow Climate Act, which really solidified 1.5 as the limit. Now that, again, that article, article two, if you ask an international law expert, that article is not even binding as such in under international law, but it does give you the consensus a global consensus is with what is the danger limit. And that is then, it gives you, informs what under your national law, whether it's a duty of a special duty of care or a human rights obligation should be the basis, the scientific basis upon which you then 
uh, determine what each country should be doing. And that obviously that then still requires some scientific translation. In our case, we used the advice of the IPCC. If you look at another case, for instance, a very important case by uh, the German Constitutional Court, a very important court in Europe, not only for Germany, it is the most important court, but it's a very, I mean, it's seen as a, a very uh, important court also beyond uh, beyond those borders, there the German Constitutional Court looked at a scientific report by a National Advisory Council. And that National Advisory Council had determined the global carbon budget for what it interpreted to be a fair uh, interpretation of well below two degrees, that was 1.75 uh, degrees of, of warming. It looked at the global carbon budget and it says, well, that budget needs to be divided upon, uh, between countries. We take 2015 as a starting date, and we then say, what is the available budget as of then? Part of that budget has been used up. Uh, uh, what is left and how do we divide it among uh, countries? We do that uh, on an e equal per capita basis, which is a very intuitive way of dividing that budget. And the, the result of that simple exercise was, well, with the current target, the current German target, which is informed by the European Union target, all emissions available to Germany would already be depleted by 2030. You would have no emissions left after 2030. So the, the, the consequence, the, the conclusion that the court drew from that is, well, you're, this is irresponsible. You are leaving no emission uh, uh, space left for the generation basically after 2030. So in theory, everybody would have to turn off all the lights as of that point, right? You know, take a tent, go into the forest and live from whatever uh, to, to, to make it a bit more graphic. That is unconstitutional. You would be violating the rights of those people uh, in that period. So either you're violating your climate obligations or you're violating the rights of the, of the generation after 2030. You have to go back to the drawing board and draw, make up a new law, which more responsibly uh, the, uh, 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 spreads this available carbon budget over the coming a couple of decades. So there the court also looking at the climate science says what you're doing is clearly not enough. In that case, it didn't say exactly what it needs to be doing, but it gave the parameters in which the, the government then has to uh, um, substantiate that what it is doing is sufficient. So it's this combination of open norms, recognition of scientific danger levels, and then the translation into, well, you know, making that more uh, uh, in, into the science. And we're now at a point in climate change that the crisis is so big that there's really no more room for discussion with regards to the science and, and what needs to be done. And that's why it is becoming uh, really the role of courts to also hold countries uh, to account in, in, in this respect. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Cassandra, there is a question for you, and I want to piggyback on this question, because what was interesting to me in the Urgenda case was they based a lot of the arguments on the right to life and right to privacy and family life, so those European Convention of Human Rights. And the right to a healthy environment, if I'm not mistaken, is not enshrined in any of Australia's federal laws uh, or national or territory laws. I, I, I'm not sure, so maybe you can speak on that, but do you think that this case holds potential for legal reform, articulating a stronger environmental right in Australia? And then linked to the question in the chat is about the duty of care. If you can elaborate why you say it is unique in the Australian context. Thank you. Yeah, certainly. Um, so it's interesting the question of rights. Um, uh, as far as I'm aware, and um, I will caveat that I, I'm not 100% sure the right to healthy environment, um, I don't think is enshrined in Australian law, but um, I am not 100% about that. Um, the um, Australia's um, enshrinement of, of various rights um, are formulated uh, separately uh, among the states ordinarily. Um, and 
it's interesting because uh, in, in my mind, any climate litigation has rights at its centre um, by its very nature. Uh, and so it's certainly one thing that comes to mind when you might think about people <clears throat> losing their livelihoods, indeed lo losing their homes, um, suffering human health consequences, suffering cultural uh, rights consequences. Um, certainly in our proceeding, the rights um, to cultural practice um, and the right to a healthy environment um, aren't a focus um, of the litigation um, although I suppose they all, they always sit in the background um, because you know they're the consequences that are really coming um, coming through when we're talking about projected harms. <clears throat> but this case, um, being a, a duty of care case, doesn't um, use rights in that way. Um, it is interesting to think about it potentially having room for reform, uh, and certainly if a duty of care was to be established, declared by the court, what governments might do about that. Um, if anything, and, and whether that would, uh, you know, project um, any type of discussions, particularly with First Nations communities um, and bodies uh, and the government about exactly what that entails um, and, and whether any other rights um, based instruments or rights, rights uh, legislation would come off it. Um, but it's all very uh, optimistic, <laughs> I think, um, thinking in that way. Um, in regards to the duty of care, it's a good question. Um, the uniqueness of the relationship between Torres Strait Islanders and, and the Commonwealth of Australia um, really hinges upon um, a few factors that you, you should be considering when determining whether a new duty of care can be established. And so when you're looking at the relationship between two parties, um, there are a number of, uh, you know, features um, of that relationship that will either sort of draw um, to water against the recognition of a new duty of care. Um, there's a certain vulnerability of uh, the, the party to whom the alleged duty is owed. And so when you look at Torres Strait Islanders <clears throat> um, being on low-lying islands, um, having very limited ability to protect themselves, uh, being these tiny islands um, against, you know, a huge global emitter like Australia um, and literally the power imbalance between them, um, you know, comes into question there. Um, we've also got uh, the uh, otherwise vulnerability of, of Torres Strait Islanders in that Indigenous people across the world and certainly in Australia um, uh, suffer higher rates of um, health consequences and are at higher risk to the effects of climate change for, um, for various reasons. Um, another factor is the control that the uh, government has over um, the, the, the class um, of people um, and certainly uh, any responsibility that they assume for, um, for that group of people uh, and instruments like the treaty um, and like native title legislation and, and, and um, those types of things um, you know, really help uh, that feature um, in our favour. Um, something else is, is sort of the what, what courts speak about as proximity. So the closeness of the relationship between <clears throat> the two parties and, um, you know, that's something uh, that you can think of in, um, uh, in a legal sense. Proximity is... Um, you know, often, um, I suppose, a, almost a philosophical concept, um, you know, how quickly does one party's actions or how much um, of one party's management or control or actions have, um, have on the other. And, um, you know, I suppose, um, you know, being a part of the Commonwealth of Australia, the Torres Strait Islands are, um, you know, are subject to the will of the government. And, um, you know, they're the ones hardest felt um, by these impacts um, of, of these emissions that just aren't reducing. So um, th those, I mean, I could go on, but also all sorts of things um, like that are, are what you should be considering um, when establishing that duty of care. And so, uh, I don't know, um, I hadn't really thought about this maybe being played out in other circumstances, I guess, where trying to take a one step at a time, but um, I guess it's not um, out of the question that other governments with uh, vulnerable um, First Nations um, communities, um, might, it might be argued, 
that those types of duties um, could be owed as well. Thank you so much, Cassandra. I see Ten Dai has a question next. Thanks, Angela. And just uh, building on from what you just said, Cassandra, um, you know, climate impacts will be felt uh, more severely by vulnerable communities, such as those in the Torres Straits. I'd just like to know whether the Agenda Foundation, Dennis, does any work outside of the Netherlands and in other, I'd say, vulnerable areas, just to build capacity and, you know, facilitate access to climate litigation for those people who are affected by climate change, but do not have the capacity and or the knowledge or the know-how or access to these services. I mean, how can we, how can we facilitate and build capacity in that respect? Yes, thank you, Tendai. I, I think so, uh, the, the, it, the short answer is yes and no. Um, yes, in the sense that we started after uh, our uh, uh, after we won the case, we got a lot of uh, requests from people helping them, and uh, we we are not, you know, we we are a Dutch we are Dutch association. We're not actually originally a litigation outfit. Um, uh, we we I I I started in 2013 at the Urgenda Foundation as the only lawyer at the time to work on this case together with our attorneys. Um, and then we and because we won, it became a really big thing. We felt like, well, we actually have to help people outside of the Netherlands as well um, that have all these very similar uh, questions and, 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 and want to know how they can do it in their own country. Um, so we started the Climate Litigation Network for that purpose, to help other uh, people around the world with, with, with these types of uh, climate cases um and, and and to share knowledge and to get people connected etc so that's what we have been doing uh and that's been a very large part of what i've been doing in the last past seven years together with my colleagues at here at their agenda however um uh what what our main focus has been has been on the global north because those are the countries that you know they bear the responsibility uh for uh, the situation that we are in and, and that kind of like gets back to uh, what I uh, what we said earlier about, you know, is, is, is litigation the right tool? One of the big <laughs> uh, limitations to this model is that you can only, you know, th these national legal systems are framed in a way that only the, the, the rights or, you know, these duties or rights or whatever you want to call them are with regards to the residents inside of those jurisdictions and usually those are not the most vulnerable people so there have been attempts in a couple of cases to actually include also people and interests from the global south in these global north cases but that's really difficult i mean there are lots of hurdles with regards to jurisdiction and and, and uh, that that then have to be overcome so unfortunately that has been difficult um but i also think that that's what really makes this you know, this Australian case very special because we have this high vulnerability of these people within a what you can call, you know, one of the climate crooks uh, um, in that sense. Um, I also think that that's one of the reasons I personally feel strong about this Australian case as well, because it is a case about the responsibility of such a large polluter where we get, you know, where you get to discuss actually and these, these, these interests of these very vulnerable people are very visible and alive, um, but um, um, how that's going to develop going into the future, I don't know. It might be that at the international law level, there will be more clarity with regards to um, the, 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 the uh, obligations between states uh, under international law. Um, there's a case being prepared before the International Court of Justice uh, in, in this respect that might serve as a jumping board for then other cases where Global South voices are much more uh, represented, because I, I very much uh, agree with the need for that. But we're, you know, we're, we're working with an imperfect tool uh, in that sense to, to address this crisis that is imperfect, but it's one of the tools that has effect right now, and we're just trying to make most of it, basically. Thank you, Dennis. Do you have a follow-up to Indai? 
Otherwise, I no, have no. a message. All right. I have another question, and it actually ties well into what you were just alluding to about international law and the international courts. Uh, I would like to hear just maybe your opinion, Dennis, and also Cassandra. Do you think that obviously there is a place for domestic courts and it's made a very big difference in the Netherlands and you know we'll see how and in Germany, for instance. But do you think that we should or one should advocate a stronger role for the international courts, especially regarding what you just said uh, with the global south? And yeah, you know, given the criticisms against the international court. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, is, is the ICJ or the criminal court the right way to go? Do you think we need a specialized international court for climate change? Yeah. Well, if I take those, if I take those three points, I think that this case now before the ICJ, it's the right timing. Uh, that's my sense. Uh, for such a case to be heard by the ICJ. Um, I also think that it actually has been helpful that there has been already the solidification of these rights and norms in various countries and not only in the Netherlands and Germany, but also in Latin America and in, 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 in certain uh, other jurisdictions outside of Europe. So it's really becoming this more of a global sense that yes, human rights are at stake, human rights are being violated. And I do think, although the human rights as such are not the main question put before uh, the ICJ, this very much helps. Uh, so I do, uh, to, to put a question to a court, which has also been known to be a conservative court for, for many different reasons. Um, and I think that that leads me to the second, um, yeah, it would be, we do need stronger international frameworks. The problem has been is that we've been negotiating for 30 years what these frameworks should look like, and it hasn't brought us all that much. So again, climate, domestic climate litigation is really a response to the failure of a global governance system. The global governance system is not there, but we do have these domestic systems. And this domestic litigation might very well help to get a better global governance system, but the efforts in themselves to get a better global governance system, to get a, you know, a global climate court or actually a functioning, a functioning treaty that 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 says, well, these are your these are your responsibilities with regards to emission reductions. These are your responsibilities with regards to the damage you have caused, because we are not even close to having that discussion yet, although it's been on the agenda for 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 over 20 years now. I mean, that's a discussion that definitely needs to be had. We are already almost at one and a half, 1.5 degrees. I mean, the, the projections are is that we're actually, you know, one of the next five years, there's a 50, 50% 50 chance of one of those five years, we cross 1.5, you know, that the year after it might be a bit below, but then permanently in 10 to 15 years, we're there. That's a lot of damage that has already been done. And it has, we know who has done that damage. That's not a secret. We know where the emissions came from. So, uh, and yes, we need to have a global governance system that actually deals with that. But until that time, until that arrives, I do think it's going to be domestic litigation that's going to drive that agenda. Thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, is there any questions from the attendees? Anyone um, that would like to ask a question to the speakers, you can raise your hand, you can write in the chat box. Yes, so we have a question from Peter Cantor. Uh, are there any other cases in the pipeline that you know of that would help? That's probably to Cassandra or Dennis, it doesn't matter. I feel like Dennis uh, would be more knowledgeable of cases in the pipeline <laughs> than myself <laughs> with his position. Well, I think, I mean, it's a, very, it's, it's a very broad question. There's a lot, a lot that you could potentially cover under this. I think uh, there, there are many different types of, uh, of cases. I mean, if you just look at uh, South Africa, 
to the extent that I'm aware of, there has been a, a very big judgment in relation to a coal-fired power plant and how that's uh, damaging uh, human health. And I think that that's very helpful. Yes, we need to go, you know, so sort of, and to put that in a category, we need to look at what are the sources and what is the infrastructure that is causing the problem and find ways to delay the building of that infrastructure or then and or entirely prevent it and often delay actually lead to such a, leads to prevention and that's also a tactic that for instance in the united states which is seen as a, a country where climate litigation has been less successful that tactic has actually worked in the united states with 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 the complete cancellation of enormous amounts of coal fire power plants but it's not only about coal fire power but also about oil and gas infrastructure um i think where we are not yet, but what, what a next frontier with regards to government responsibilities uh, in relation to climate change. Uh, we're now seeing that in the global north, um, uh, uh, finance, so finance being provided by the global north for uh, fossil fuel infrastructure in the global south is being targeted. Um, uh, that's one part. Where we haven't seen a lot yet, which I do think will be a next frontier, is with regards to aviation and shipping. And what are the responsibilities of states with regards to that? Because, you know, interestingly enough, even within those national cases, when we look at how do we divide the carbon budget, we pretend that aviation and shipping doesn't exist. Right. So if you look at the uh, at the carbon budget division, for instance, that the German Constitutional Court used, it takes the entire carbon budget and divides it among countries and then says only domestic uh, emissions count. But we know that we have aviation and shipping emissions as well. So there's kind of like this strange, you know, pretending it doesn't exist because it's not covered by the Paris Agreement. But that doesn't mean that a country doesn't have any obligations with regards to building a new uh, airport. I mean, is that really responsible right now, for instance, and, and the types of ships that it might allow in, in its port or not. So that's kind of like the government side of it. But what we also see is that there's a lot of uh, uh, litigation against corporations. In the Netherlands, there was a very well-known case, now globally as well, against the, uh, the, the, the oil company Shell, where uh, the Dutch court concluded that Shell itself has a responsibility to reduce its emissions, not only the emissions that it produces while producing the oil, but also the emissions of its customers. You know, there is a, 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 an obligation of effort with regards to also having reducing the emissions of, of their customers that buy their products. Um, we're seeing that type of uh, litigation spreading, uh, spreading to, to other countries as well. And also a big part of that is what is now called greenwashing uh, greenwashing type of litigation, because we have seen many global corporations, you know, paying lip service to the Paris Agreement saying, yes, we support the Paris Agreement. It's almost not done if you don't, right? You can better do it because if you don't, you're going to get, you know, it's not good for your corporate brand. But now that all these, you know, corporations have done that, uh, people are taking those corporations to court and saying, you're telling us that you're um, uh, uh, that your uh, policies are in line with the Paris Agreement, but you have nothing to show for. And, and that's not necessarily even rights-based litigation. That's actually shareholders that are saying, listen, if you don't adapt, then my shareholder value is at stake. So we're seeing many, uh, so that's one part, but actually also um, uh, misleading advertisements. So uh, uh, people going to, 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 to advertisement agencies saying, and that there are a couple of cases, this is a case now launched in France. I'm aware of a case that has been won in the Netherlands twice, again, again against Shell. Shell said, you know, you can, you can uh, fill your tank car carbon neutral. There were big banners at every Shell station in the country. And there were a couple of students that went to, to, to the authority that oversees misleading uh, advertisement and said, listen, this is entirely misleading. This has nothing, you know, Shell can't buy a couple of carbon credits somewhere and then say that this is, uh, this is carbon free or climate neutral uh, uh, um, uh, way of, of transport. And, and the authority on misleading advertisement agreed. So you see many different ways to, to now kind of pressure both the government and corporations. And, and the field of climate litigation has really been growing by the year. And, and that's just 
um, I, I think that shows two things: a, the size of the, the crisis that we're in, and b, that you know people generally see this as a way to put pressure on the system in many different instances. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, we have a comment and or question, and I want to piggyback on that. So recently in South Africa, we had extreme flooding in the KwaZulu-Natal province around our coastline, lots of death, deaths, millions of, of um, you know, financial quantities of destruction. And in the recent, uh, in a recent legal brief, I see that, I, I don't think it's been launched yet, but there are plans to bring a case against government um, for capable of culpable homicide for the deaths caused by this natural disaster. I don't know if this case will, will be taken forward with that argument, but there is speculation. And we also have a comment from Peter saying that it seems that natural disasters really do seem to gain at least the attention of, of the political uh, powers. And do you think that ultimately it's going to take more frequent or extreme or severe natural disasters to get us to move towards an effective global governance system? Um, well, hopefully we are able to act before that really happens, uh, I guess, uh, but we see that they are effective in the sense of indeed focusing the minds. To that extent, I think as, 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 as climate activists, uh, as a group, um, we have to also uh, use those events in a sense to, to show the general population, listen, this is what is happening and we know why it is happening. We should not let people get away with, you know, this is just a natural disaster. Uh, no, this is a man-made disaster, right? Uh, we shouldn't be talking about na natural disaster as such anymore. This is, this is man-made uh, uh, because it, it, climate change is man-made. Um, so we will see more disasters. I, I hope that these disasters will also lead to more effective global um, uh, uh, action, but I also don't know whether that's necessarily going to be the case. I mean, it might also be that countries now that the, the impacts are happening, they're going to be, all their attentions are going to be focused on adaptation, right? Oh yeah, we need to adapt to the next natural disaster. So. Uh, uh, we need to, uh, it, it is definitely not going to solve it in itself. It doesn't necessarily take the attention away, but it also doesn't necessarily lead to the right action. And that's why I think litigation, again, in the context of such a natural disaster happening can also actually help to get the focus in, 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 in the right place to say, well, a, a case that is about, well, this damage was caused by the contribution of X country or X uh, uh, or X corporation doesn't only potentially create a, a, a liability, but it also tells a story that can then be politically used about where the responsibilities lie and where the, uh, the real uh, uh, solutions to this problem lie. And that is in reducing our emissions as fast as possible. And now, you know, now that the damage to a certain extent, a lot of the damage is done that we can't really take away. We have to deal with the current climate as it is. We can't turn the clock back. So we also actually have to have government stepping up on how are we going to protect our people against the impacts that are now inevitable. And I assume, and that's not something that I mentioned before, but a lot of more adaptation, I, I think it's inevitable that adaptation type of uh, litigation is also going to uh, uh, you know, become a new trend. Thank you so much. Uh, we have basically reached our time and it's such a pity. I think that all of this just leads to more questions for debate. To my mind, we can ask uh, a significant amount of questions about what is the role of proportionality uh, on the side of the state when we start asking these questions. Uh, to what extent do we have to look at historical contributions to emissions? Should countries like the Commonwealth be held to a higher standard, things like that. But definitely a scope um, for another webinar in the future. Thank you so much for taking the time, Dennis and Cassandra, to speak to us today. It was an excellent presentation and we really appreciate your time and effort. Thanks for having us. It was great to be here. Thank you. Thanks very much.
Thank you, Dennis and Cassandra. Thanks, and thank you as well to all of our attendees. We will, um, this has been recorded, so with your permission, Cassandra and Dennis, but I will do that over email. We will, would like to make this video available on our YouTube channel and web page. And then everyone, uh, if anyone from the audience has questions, you can contact me and I can put you into contact with the speakers as well. Great, thank you and thank you Tendai. This was great and we'll all keep in touch and correspond further over email. All right, goodbye everyone. Cheers everyone.